Yeah, that's perfect. So, today we'll be looking at Acts chapter 4 as a whole. And, yes, we will be talking about a winning witness. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father Lord, we thank you for this beautiful opportunity to share your word. And I pray that you open our heart, our mind. I pray that we will be receptive to your word. And I pray that your word will dwell in us and be able to build us up. That after today's message, we will be a living example of your word in our you know, in our locations, or in our suburbs, in the area you have placed us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So to give you a bit of context, early part of Acts chapter 4 is a continuation of Acts chapter 3. So what happened is, Peter and John went to the temple to pray they met a man that was born lame for all his life. And he was at the temple gate asking for an. Peter and John said, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have we will give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. So this miracle, he stood up and walked, and that created chaos. All hell broke loose. So the Jewish council, rulers, elders, summoned Peter and John, what they have done. They were arrested. After they had the hearing, they were not happy with what they did, but they couldn't find anything significant to continue detaining them. Meanwhile, the man that was healed was happy the whole village people were happy. Everybody in the town was talking about this miracle. There was joy, there was excitement. Who wouldn't be? Like, can you imagine you being crippled for 40 years and somebody walks up to you and say, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus, and that happened? You would definitely be happy. The whole Clemson Park would be happy. The whole King's Grove would be happy the whole Sydney will be happy. That is the simple truth. Then, in that moment of happiness, can you imagine the high court of Sydney summon you? Why did you preach in the name of Jesus? It would be ironic to put you in jail when you have done something that brought joy and happiness to the world, which they don't like. So this was... The, the setting, this was actually what happened in Acts chapter 3 and early part of chapter 4. Now, to get into the context of the message, we are looking at a winning witness. So this, is, this season is a season of we talk about Jesus. So it's all, it's all about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So everything happening this period, November, December, January, is about Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. Jesus Christ. But the question is, how do we communicate this Jesus to the people? How do we communicate this Jesus to our community? How do we, how do we communicate effectively to the lost soul, to people that haven't heard about Christ, or people that have heard about it, but doesn't have any relationship with God. How do we communicate about it? So today's message is about communication. Specifically, we will examine how to effectively communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word witness or soul winning often create fear, anxiety, or guilt in believers. You know, this is something I'm pretty sure everybody here will reckon with that. When you talk about preaching, evangelism, so winning, let's go out and speak to the people. It creates a level of fear and anxiety in the life of believers. Most believers 
Why we love God, we want to come to church, do everything. When it comes to evangelism, this is one aspect we become so reserved about. So today, we will be looking at how do we communicate this? Understanding that our commission is simply to communicate, to speak, to preach, helps us relieve the negative emotions associated with evangelism. For evangelism to be effective, the saint must recognize that God's evangelistic call extends to all Christians. It is not limited to certain groups or leaders in the church. In every church setting, people think that to preach, you know, to evangelize, to go out and do community services is the work of the pastors. No, it's the work of each and every one of us. How many are we here? 15, 20, 30? Is it the work of each and every one of us? It's not the work of the pastor to go to the community and evangelize. It's not the work of the deacons or the elders. No, it is the work of everybody. And it doesn't matter the age. Young, medium, old, God gives, God has called us into this commission to preach the gospel. And he has given to each and every one of us what it takes to do that. And he gives each and every one of us an opportunity to execute that. God does equip the church with, you know, the gift, evangelistics. There is a difference between evangelism and evangelist. Why some he gave the gift, you know, to be apostles, to be teachers, to be pastors, to be evangelists, we don't mistake that to evangelism. Evangelism is for everybody. While at the same time, we still have our respective or positions God has called us into, like some pastors, evangelists, you know, missionaries, and all those. Now, note the use of the plural pronouns in this text. Verse 31 indicates that the apostles we are joined by the rest of the church in speaking the message of the gospel. In an amazing answer to prayer, God empowers ordinary Christians with extraordinary boldness to witness for Christ, to speak to the community for Christ. And this morning we're going to look at few points on how we can effectively communicate the gospel. One is spend time with Christ. Verses 13 and 20 in early chapter 4, you know, refers to this. One of the principles for effective communication of the gospel is to spend time with Christ. And I want to ask, let's pause for a second. Are we spending time with Christ? Now, mind you, Christ is not here as we speak. He's not physically here. But he is with us and he is, this is his word. So are we spending time with Christ? Are we immersing ourselves, soaking ourselves in prayer and studying the word? Sometimes we became very complacent about the Bible. We think, oh, my parents are pastors. I was born in the church, you know. Oh, They started teaching me the Bible from even when I was one year old, you know, up until now that I'm 43. So I know the Bible. I don't, you become complacent about it that you don't see the need to spend time in the Word of God. So the question is, are we spending time with Christ? And two ways to do that, in prayer, and consistently studying the word of God. The Bible said that this book of law should not depart out of your mouth. Thou shalt meditate in it during and night, that you might know and, you know, observe. So it's about consistently studying the word of God. There is never a time you could exhaust the knowledge of the Bible. I'm yet to see when we can... 
anybody who could come forward to say, I have come to a point where I now know everything in the Bible. Because it is a living book. Each time you read it, there is a fresh revelation, a fresh message. You can preach in John chapter 1, verse 1 for the rest of your life because it's a living book. God gives you revelations and messages that are fresh and fresh and fresh on a regular basis. So we need to be spending time with Christ. Verse 13 says the community took note that this man had been with Christ. When the Jewish councils, the leaders arrested them, they knew, they, they, they reckoned, they attest to it that this man, Peter and John, has spent time with Christ. How do they know? They were not there to see it. But the things they have done, the miracle they performed, confirm that they have spent time with Christ. And if Peter and John did not spend time with Christ, perhaps they wouldn't have been in a position to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what the miracle they did. It is important in this season that if we are going to effectively communicate to the community about the birth of Jesus Christ, the purpose of Christmas, that this God is so precious, so loving, that he gave his son Jesus Christ to die for us. The Bible said that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if we are going to get the attention of the community, then we need to be spending time in God's word. When we spend time in God's word, we will be able to effectively communicate the gospel to the, you know, to the community, to our locals. Verse 20 informs Peter, Peter informs the religious leaders that he is simply speaking about things he had seen and heard, about things he has seen when he was spending time with Christ, and the things he has heard Christ talk about when they were together. These verses obviously refers to the apostles, but the context reveals a very simple yet powerful truth for all believers. It reveals a very simple truth for you and for myself today, you know, for us to embrace. Now, people spend time to talk about what interests them, right? Grandparents talk about grandchildren. I can tell you with my own grandparents, they can't show up about their grandchildren, including me. People that play soccer talk about soccer. So whatever interests you, you spend time to talk about it, right? You reckon with it. You want people to know. Now, if Christ interests us, do we spend time to talk about Christ? Do we spend time to read the Bible? Do we spend time to pray? And when we get out of the community, when people are talking about the AFL game, you know, now is they are playing tennis, I play golf and tennis, I've been watching PGA and tennis since yesterday. And when I hang out with my friends with coffee, we're talking about, you know, what Cameron did, he got it wrong and his swing wasn't good. If we spend time with Christ, and catch up with people in the community for coffee. They will talk about, oh, bro, did you see what the Bible says in this? You know, I got a message from, you know, I was spending time, you know, meditating upon the word of God, and God was speaking to me, we need to do this for God, we need to go and pray. They will spend time to talk about those things that interests us. When you spend time with Christ, it becomes an area you will want to reckon with people. Yeah, praise God. The second point, seek with conviction. Verses 24 to 30, seek with conviction. The primary way to spend time with Christ is by seeking Christ through prayer and his word. Jesus said to seek first his kingdom, Matthew 6, 33. 
Through prayer and through reading your Bible, we identify with Christ's love for people. Through prayer and studying the Bible, we destroy strongholds of the enemy. Through prayer and studying the Word of God, we receive the power to boldly share the gospel. We receive the power to boldly share the gospel. Verses 24 to 30 of Acts chapter 4 reveals what the saints prayed in unity. They prayed in unity. After Peter and John were arrested, summoned to the council square, but they could not find anything against them to jail them. They let them go, but they were reprimanded. Do not, and we mean it, do not preach or speak or teach in the name of this Jesus. And Peter and John looked at them and laughed. And they did not agree to that because they were convinced in the name they are teaching. Why are they so sure? Why are they so convinced? Because they have spent time with Christ. So, are we convinced about this Christ? If we are not convinced, then we are not praying enough. Then we are not spending time in studying the word of God enough. Then we are not open and receptive to, the, to, the, to what the Holy Spirit is telling us about. Because I tell people, when you read the Bible, don't read it as another novel. The author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. And each time you open your Bible to read, even if it's one verse, always say, always ask the author of the, of the Scripture, the Holy Spirit, to open your inner eyes of understanding to behold what God is talking about in this moment through his word. And when that happens, you will be convinced. You will, be con you, you will have the conviction of this word. And you can boldly go out and share the gospel. Sometimes I catch strength to work, and I don't know how many of you catch strength on a regular basis. Sometimes you can stay in the carriage and you see some of these traders talking about things, some are talking about their girlfriends, some are talking, and they'll be talking so loud, like so loud, you will like, are you guys okay? And one day I'm like, can I not just talk about Christ so loud in the train? What have I got to lose? If unbelievers are talking nonsense in the train and they just don't care who you are, why should I, why should I not talk about something very, very relevant? You know, this has been playing in my mind. And one day God tested me. I saw a lady in the train, so damn sick, crying. I was scared. <laughs> I was scared to go to her to say, can I pray for you? I, and in that moment, there were people talking a lot of, excuse my word, nonsense. At that moment, I summoned up courage. I walk up to the lady, I say, excuse me, I've observed you not feeling all right. Are you all right? She said, no, I'm so sick. I said, can I pray for you? And everybody in the train, every eyes was on me. I said, can I pray for you? I said, I'm not the one to heal you. I'm a Christian. It is God that heals, but he heals through us. I can pray for you and leave the rest for him. I told him, if you don't get healed, sorry that we've gone on with me, please. <laughs> and people laughed. And I prayed with him. In less than a few seconds, he was like, who are you? And I was also shocked. I was also sure, even though there was a bit of fear in me, that I was also convinced that God heals. And I really thank God that I passed that test because I'm not going to lie to you. I was scared. I was scared. I'm like, if nothing happened, I would gently exit the train, covering my face, and disappear. Seek with conviction. This is Christmas. Next week, Sunday, our kids will be presenting, you know, and we need to be 
talking to the people when they present, they need to present with conviction of the death of Jesus Christ, why he died for us, that through him we can escape eternal destruction and gain eternal life. Praise God. The next point, speak with confidence. I would say when I prayed the train, I didn't have enough confidence to be honest. I'm not going to tell you lies. But that taught me a lesson, the importance of speaking with confidence. Because when you, when you seek with conviction, man, you will be bold. You will be bold. Verse 31 says, God answered their prayer for boldness. But understand the test could have read, they responded with obedience to speak with boldness. Now, God did not remove the obstacle. And sometimes we Christians, we pray for God to remove the problem. The problem is not going to go away. It's going to be there. We're going to face hardship. The economy is going to get bad. Sometimes it will get good. There's going to be inflation. RPA is going to make an announcement that if you're a mortgage person here, you're going to get upset. That is the simple truth. Interest is going to go up that you will get annoyed. You're going to walk into calls. A lo- How much is a loaf of bread now? $6, $7. 15 years ago, how much was it? $1.80. So if you are here 15 years ago and you are here now, you're not going to be happy to hear that bread has gone up so much. So we cannot pray for God to remove the hardship. We cannot pray for God to remove the problem. No. What are we going to be praying about? To give us the grace to get through. To give us the strength to overcome. To give us the boldness to take on that challenge and triumph. The saints we are criticized and some we are persecuted for their witness. Now, the anointing with boldness and speaking are simultaneous event. You don't pray for boldness. You don't pray to receive boldness before you act. No. Bible say, open your mouth and I will fill it with word. And I will give you words that none of your adversaries will resist. Boldness kicks in at the time of speaking. So we Christians, we first pray, God, give us boldness. And then after praying, I can't feel it. I don't have that boldness to go and speak to that person. It works simultaneously. All you need is courage. Don't worry about the boldness. The first thing you need is seek with conviction, have that courage, walk up to her and say, can I pray for you? And the boldness kicks in because they walk hand in hand. We do not store up boldness for future encounter, no. God provides the boldness when we are ready to obey the call to witness for Christ. Is a commission. You know, go into the world and preach to all nations. When we respond in obedience, when we speak, when we respond in obedience, to speak with confidence, the boldness kicks in. So, this Christmas, I will seek in Christ with conviction. I will going to be speaking to people in our community with confidence of what Christmas is all about. About the birth of Christ. Praise God. The next point. Yeah, I will skip this. So this just makes reference to to seeking with confidence. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand. How, will, how you would defend yourself. 
for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. And this is what happened to Peter and John when they were summoned. They spoke with confidence, with boldness, that the Jewish council, the leaders, could not resist. Even though within them, they were not happy. But they could not resist. Praise God. Share with compassion. Being the last point, share with compassion. Verses 32 to 36. Share with compassion. The command to witness for Christ is not just a military assignment that we execute as an obedient soldier. Christ honoring witnessing flows from a compassionate heart. Matthew 9, 6 says, Christ, when Christ saw the multitude, he had compassion on them. Do our hearts break for the same thing that breaks God's heart? Do we know what breaks God's heart? The lost souls. God can't stand it. He couldn't stand people to perish. That's why he gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And when we see people in our community that haven't come to the knowledge of the gospel, do our heart break? Do we cry? Sometimes I listen to the news, you know, Channel 7, and you hear what is happening in Queensland, teenage boys, 14 years, 16 years old, you know, breaking into house, stealing cars. And when I saw such things, my heart break. I was just, God, I don't know these boys, but you know them. Reach out. Create circumstances that will bring them to the knowledge of the truth. Do our heart breaks for what breaks God's heart. God doesn't want us to perish. God's heart is always broken when he sees people perishing in sin. When he sees people wasting their life in sin, it breaks God's heart. And if that breaks our heart, then we should share with compassion. We should show compassion to these people. It's not just by giving arms. Yes, the, 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 the first century Christian, they sold their possessions, they brought the, you know, the, the proceeds, they shared it among themselves. There is one aspect of it. But let's be truth. In the environment we live now, how many of you have house to sell and donate the money to the church? We don't. How many of you have farms to sell and donate the money? But there are other ways we can show compassion. In the absence of selling our possessions and bringing the money to share with the needy, we can still show compassion by sharing the gospel. How many of you have watched news and you see terrible things happening and right there and then you pray and intercede for what is happening? It's one thing I always do. Whenever I listen to me, I say, ah, you know, this person has been charged for murder of an 18-year-old girl. I say, God, you see that person. Right now, I know it breaks your heart and that is the person Christ died for. Lord, reach out. Let his soul be saved. I believe in the law. I'm a lawyer. I believe that the law should act when it needs to, but that is not the end of it. Why that person has been charged is going to be prosecuted, is going to be set, you know, sentenced 10 years. I also believe that it is important for their soul to be saved because being in jail doesn't save their soul. It's a punishment of breaking the law. But I always pray, Lord, while in jail, let him come to the knowledge of the truth that he will work out a child of God. And that is how we can show compassion. Peter and, you know, Peter and John say, save and good, we don't have. I don't have any land to sell. I don't have any property to sell. I don't have any, you know, asset to sell. The one I have, I'm not gonna sell it and live on the street. But we have other ways to show compassion. Let us share with compassion. And this Christmas, I want to encourage us to share with compassion. If you don't have chocolate to send to your neighbor or anything, you can share the gospel. You can share with compassion. Praise God. 
And in conclusion, we, have, we could have the best training resources money can buy. But the truth is that resources do not reach people. People reach people. God uses us, each and every one of us, to reach people. And whether you believe it or not, whether you are aware or not, God always creates an opportunity for us to reach out to people. It's just that sometimes we don't see it. Either we are too busy to see it, or we just don't pay attention, or we care less. But God always creates opportunity for us to reach people. Saints who seek the commission spend time with Christ. They seek with conviction. They speak with confidence. And they share with compassion. Can expect a loving God to use their winning witness to save souls. May God bless his word in Jesus' name. Amen.